It doesn't mean that the American government has to change everything radically, but it has to, I think, redress certain uh, imbalances. Unless it does that, then um, not only is extremism not going to go away, it's going to grow. I mean, similarly, for governments in the region, unless they address the real problems that they have domestically, other than through repression, in the long term, extremism is always going to go. The West always says that Islam is not compatible with democracy, and in fact, uh, what happens is, uh, if if Muslims uh, go into elections and they win those elections, like what happened in Turkey and in Algeria, they in fact they threaten secular states and, and so forth. It's better to keep them away from power. That's why a lot of uh, Western governments support uh, uh, non-democratic Muslim governments. Now. W do you, do you agree with them, Professor, in the sense that it's, it's better to have uh, dictators or authoritarians rather than have Muslims who, in one way or another, will revert to becoming dictators at one day? Does Islam, in a way, uh, promote democracy? Uh, I, actually, I and a colleague wrote a book called Islam and Democracy, in which what we basically argue is that um, it's, it's a Muslim choice as to how they decide to uh, interpret or to apply their religion with regard to political systems. But we basically argue that there are many Muslims who say this, and, and, and we would tend to agree that Islam is capable of supporting systems of broad political participation, whether you want to call it democracy or not. Some people have a problem with the term democracy, the word, because they see it as somehow Western, and that it can support many forms of political participation. I think that the, the Western notion of supporting authoritarian regimes is twofold. One, there's an inherent fear of the mixing of religion and politics and the examples of places like Iran and Sudan and the Taliban in Afghanistan reinforce that fear. Two, there's a tendency as in the Cold War to believe that it's... Uh, you, may, you may not like dictatorships, but if you've got dictators who are willing to deliver on your issues, which may be access to oil or, or um, the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, okay. then you support those dictators. And so, for example, uh, that explains United States policy with regard to Tunisia in many ways. We'll come back to your point, Professor, but we have Muhammad uh, on the telephone line. Hello, Muhammad. Hello. Can you speak a bit louder, Muhammad? Yes, uh, I have a question for Mr. John. I think we have a problem uh, with, 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 the connect, with, with the volume. Muhammad, can you speak a bit louder? Yes, I have a question for Mr. John. Yes. Uh, I would like Mr. John to uh, let us know his views regarding uh, my question to him. Yes. Uh, does he see that uh, in the West in general, yes. uh, uh, there is a general understanding that the system of governance in Islam, uh, is it perceived uh, as an alternative system to the existing uh, system of governance throughout the world, you know. Mm -hmm. right, thank you, Muhammad. Uh, Professor, he's, he's speaking, does, uh, does Islam, or, or the system uh, of uh, Islamic governance, uh, offer an alternative to capitalism, maybe communism, socialism, uh, other forms of governments which are at, at the moment being applied worldwide? I think and that's that what makes the West scared, that once uh, an Islamic... Uh, form of government uh, is established, it will in a way conflict with capitalism, for example. I think there's a generic concern among many Americans, not all, um, since in America people are raised uh, with the notion of separation of uh, religion and the state, as it were, separation of church and state, that uh, religious governments are going to be uh, far less democratic, far more restrictive, etc. Uh, but uh, there are those of us who would argue that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, however, I think I need to mention that there is no single clear model of an Islamic government. And many Muslims would say this. An Islamic government uh, is not a government that's informed by the principles and values of Islam. In modern times, that could take many forms, depending on the local country or culture. And therefore, when, when let's say, if a Western government were to immediately make certain presumptions about that Islamic government, they can't. They have to look at a specific government to just, you know... But is the West at the moment making presumptions about some countries which have raised the banner of uh, Islamic governance? For example, you spoke about Iran and Sudan. Uh, going back to the issue which we just spoke about, the Taliban, for example, and, and Iran, uh, but you spoke about them being examples of how Islamic governments operate. Uh, 
But no, I didn't. I, 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 there are examples of how. Uh, certainly, the Taliban are examples of how, how uh, uh, Islam when it's a distorted, applied, how, a distorted as as I'm picture. Concerned, yeah. Yes, but Professor, don't you see that uh, what happened with the Taliban in Afghanistan and what happened in, for example, let's start with Iran. When it happened in Iran, was basically the revolution was in response to uh, uh, the U.S. interference in uh, Iranian internal affairs. There was the, over, uh, the revolution of mm. the prime minister, the overthrow, and in the Taliban as well. Uh, after the Taliban, in a way, came in '96 to Afghanistan and they brought uh, peace and security. However, the aid which was promised to the Taliban never came through. So, in a way, uh, what the Taliban did, they react to this, maybe in applying the Islamic principles. So, don't you see that, in a way, in a way, the West is to blame for no, for, for, for so. the reaction? I don't think so at all. I think that the the uh, the United States had a role with regard to Iran, and in that sense, yeah, I mean the. the uh, the uh, return of uh, the Shah after Mossadegh stepped in and the Shah left the country, the role of the CIA. In that sense, there's a responsibility. But when one looks at Afghanistan, uh, let's face it, um, the Gulf, the U.S., and Europe all joined in a good jihad uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, where I think the United States made a mistake, not deliberately, but where it made a mistake was uh, walking away from Afghanistan after it and not realizing what might happen. But at the end of the day, to say that the United States is responsible for what the Afghans did, I mean, the fact is that the Mujahideen, instead of establishing a government, they fought between themselves. They fought among themselves and raped their own country. Why should the U.S. be blamed for that? Uh, the Taliban uh, came along and the U.S. supported them as an alternative option because they saw the Taliban, uh, as many Afghans did, as restoring law and order. But the fact is the Taliban then decided to stay in power and the reason why the Taliban did what they did wasn't that they didn't get aid. And even if that were the case, the U.S. Doesn't, didn't owe the Taliban aid. The fact is that the Taliban more and more decided that they weren't just going to clean up. They were going to stay. And I think increasingly, uh, as they then became, uh, what, what they forced on the rest of the Afghans was, in fact, their Pashtun tribal practices. And they legitimated that in, the term, uh, in terms of Islam for the whole country. So is that tradition and culture interfering with the principles of Islam? Well, local traditional culture, because they imposed it on other traditional cultures you know, uh, w w within Afghanistan. And I think when Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, and particularly people like Zawahiri, the Egyptian, uh, they uh, took uh, um, uh, Mullah Omar and expanded his vision. He was never an internationalist. I mean, he was concerned primarily with Afghanistan. He could care what the international community was doing or thinking. They made him more uh, international. Happened, Of course, Western interest uh, and Western media interest in Islam uh, expanded uh, proportionately. And what happened was, in a way, we saw a, a clash uh, uh, on Muslims, whether they're living in America, whether they're living in Europe. In fact, there was targeting of Muslims, even people who were not Muslims but were associated to Islam, for example, like the Sikhs and, uh, who were turbans, who were mistaken, who were mistaken for yeah. Muslims. And we, we saw the shooting at the Texas uh, Islamic Center, and we see the killing. Uh, in Europe, it happened in Australia as well. Uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, what, did the September 11th uh, attack give a pretext for all the misconceptions to just come out uh, and, in a way, uh, some form of racism being exercised against Muslims who are living in America? I don't think it was a pretext. I think that what you had was uh, a reaction um, to what people, to what, ha what happened, what people experienced. It's very important for people to understand the extent of the trauma in America. I think an awful lot of people in the world don't understand it. I mean, many people in the world live in societies in which uh, uh, they've experienced violence, uh, warfare at home. Um, they live in societies with a high level of police, security forces, and military, you know, people visible with a lot of guns, etc., you know, I mean, in terms of uh, security forces. Americans haven't really known that to that extent. Uh, in most of all of America's wars were fought someplace else in the 20th century. Uh, and therefore, for example, if you take World War II, the British fought outside of Britain, but at night, London was bombed, and uh, another place in the UK. The United States never had that experience. Vietnam, the same thing. As, as, as terrible as Vietnam was, if you were living in America, every day you felt perfectly safe, you know, in America. Uh, so for Americans, the attack against on American soil and so massive an attack. Yeah, there had been the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, but that was kind of a blip on the screen. The, the fact that you could bring down the towers and that you could hit the Pentagon, and indeed many believe they were trying to hit the White House, and that such a small group could do it, it wasn't 
Again, it wasn't as if this was a huge army invading. Most Americans know, no huge army, there isn't a huge army that can, that can invade. Uh, but that level of vulnerability is, uh, has struck right at the core of America, and it continues to be there. Um, I was just uh, in Florida in a hotel that must be seven or eight stories high. They had an American flag in the middle of the reception area that must have been five stories high. Uh, people have sense of patriotism on their homes. That's right. I mean, it brought out a patriotism among uh, among many who probably never even thought that much about patriotism. Um, the streets of Washington for 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 a time after the bombings, even in Georgetown, uh, you know, a very sort of university area, posh area. Uh, on each corner, you might have a tank. You would have military people with weapons. Americans aren't used to that, so. What then happened was, although the president and many others said this is not a war against Islam, and there's but a there difference were, there between were Islam and extremism. There were Jews at the beginning of the campaign.